And in that security environment, with little resources, uh, with the kind of uh, threats that we perceive, we sought allies. And the most natural allies at that time for us, given the context of the Cold War, were the Western powers. Two superpowers had emerged from the Second World War, the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, the Soviet Union was not particularly keen on befriending us. Uh, it did not see us as having much of a future. The United States was more willing to embrace us because they looked at the Americans themselves did not have much experience of international relations at that time. If you read American history, which very few Pakistanis have actually done, American history is one of essentially of isolation. They don't like getting involved with the rest of the world. They only started getting involved with the rest of the world in the 20th century, between the First World War and then the Second World War and then the Cold War and the post cold War, war era. Otherwise, in the 19th century, they didn't even have much of a large standing army that played any roles beyond their own uh, territory and, 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 and the Indian wars and a few wars with uh, Mexico or territory were the only things that they actually did. So we became allies of the United States. And the convergence that we had with them of strategic interest related to uh, the expansion of communism and the expansion of the Soviet Union. We both wanted to check that. But we had a major divergence of interest even then. India was our enemy. India was not America's enemy even then. Even then. Now, usually, it's not very difficult, it's not impossible for two nations to work things out while having different enemies. For example, even today, just as Pakistan's views about India are not shared by the United States, America's views about Iran and North Korea are not shared by Pakistan. So it's perfectly possible for two nations to have an alliance in which you do not actually have a total convergence of interests. You have some interests that are common, some interests that are not common, and then some interests on which you can work together. However, through the 50s and the 60s, the alliance moved forward, and it is my contention, and you can disagree with that, and many people probably do, emotions started to play on our side, and impatience started to play on the American side. The beginning of the US-Pakistan trust deficit, as we call it today, fashionably, started in 1965. Because during the 1965 war, the Pakistani expectation was that since we've gone to war with India, the Americans should come on our side. And they said, we will not because this is not our war. Fact still remains that most of our equipment in that war was American provided. The patent tanks were American. The, uh, the, the, the Sabre aircraft were American. So we went to war with American equipment, but some of our political leaders at that time, political leaders, and some military leaders who had become politicians, like Green Marshal Ayub Khan, because once he take, took power, a military officer, when he takes over power and becomes a politician, then he starts thinking more like a politician than he does as a military officer. And Ayub Khan was the first one of, of them. And he came up with the slogan, friends not masters, and that has still lasted today. But let us be honest. Friends not masters is a slogan, not a policy, because in any case, all relationships, when no relationship is ever equal, but all relationships do not have to be so unequal as to be humiliating. And that is what we are trying to find the equilibrium for now, after many, many years. We've gone through many ups and downs, ups and downs, and of course we had an incident on the uh, night of the 1st and 2nd of May, that has also infuriated us. But again, I would invite uh, the audience, as well as everybody else, to start thinking about international relations with minimal emotion. <coughs> minimal emotion. It should be Lord Palmerston's famous saying that there are no permanent friends and permanent enemies, only permanent interests. So let's look at our environment. In our environment, what are our two principal concerns? Our security and who, if I ask you, and you are all welcome to speak out, Maybe there will be many voices, but I have a feeling that if I ask you this question and ask you to loudly answer it, there will be only one answer. What is the principal sec national security threat to Pakistan? Where does it come from? <laughs> Hold on. So those who say it comes from within, please raise your hands. Those who say it comes from India, please raise your hands. 
Gosh, India is very happy today. <laughs> Pakistan is no longer India centric as of this afternoon or this morning. And those who think it comes from the US, please raise your hands. Okay. So now, let's break it down. If it comes from within, it's something that we have to deal with. If it comes from India, we can have allies to deal with. That's right. And if it really comes from the United States, you've already lost, ladies and gentlemen, because you can't beat the United States in military confrontation, and that is a reality which we have to accept, whatever our emotions. Because, let us be honest, we do not have the means to take on the one, one military power in the world that spends more on defense technology than the next 20 nations. So that is where I think we sometimes end up having what I call emotional discussion. I saw, I see it on Pakistani television all the time. A lot of emotion that, you know, uh, it's, uh, some newspaper people have started calling it the Gairat argument. But let us be honest, the logical thing for Gairat argument is that you build the resources to compete. You, if you can't compete with someone, you defer your confrontation with. You do not confront those that you cannot fight. And so, the only alternative to uh, confrontation is isolation. Because that's an alternative too. We don't embrace them, we do not fight them. That option has implications for our second priority, apart from security. And that second priority is prosperity, economic development. What is the global economy today? Look at the global economy, and in the global economy, who are the major players? The United States is the world's biggest producer and the biggest consumer. The United States is the world's biggest lender and the world's biggest borrower. China, a great nation. Basically, who is China's biggest trading partner? <coughs> so, who, which country uh, uh, which country's uh, bonds, treasury bonds, are the biggest part of China's foreign currency reserves. And so right now we have a moment. Now I'm not saying it's a moral question of it, whether it is right or not. Like in a village, the question is never the morality of who should be jobbery, but sometimes there is a jobbery. And it's in the interest of the village not to fight with the Chaudhary, at least unless and until they have got their alignments right and they've got it all worked out. So my submission is that a reality-based foreign policy of Pakistan needs the following four elements. Number one, we need to be aware of the two, three